Welcome to Central Virginia. I've been to most of the major Civil War battlefields in the east, a few of the ones in the west as well, but I don't think I've ever been to a battlefield where you could absolutely feel the weight of the death, the horror, and the destruction the way that you do here at Cold Harbor. I'm standing uh, just behind Confederate trenches, some of the best preserved uh, trench works from the Civil War in existence today. And behind me are woods that were assaulted by the division of Thomas Neal of the Union Army of the Potomac's 6th Corps on the morning of June 3rd. And what has gone down in history is one of the most ill-advised and uh, poorly planned, poorly executed assaults of the entire war. The area that we'll take a look at in just a minute is just one of many connected with the Battle of Cold Harbor. And the Battle of Cold Harbor was more than just the Union assault on the morning of June 3rd. It is the part that most of us remember and that is the part we're going to talk about today because it is the, really it's the only area of the battlefield that is still preserved today. So let's talk about the events that led up to the assault on June 3rd, talk about the events of that day, and then talk about the aftermath. In March of 1864, Ulysses S. Grant was given overall command of all Union forces with the rank of Lieutenant General. He immediately put in motion a plan that called for five Union armies to move simultaneously on the South, preventing them from reinforcing different places at different times. Grant would travel with the Army of the Potomac under command of Major General George Gordon Meade. Beginning in May of 1864, the Overland Campaign, as it came to be known, was a series of maneuvers by the Army of the Potomac to get between Lee and Richmond. They clashed in bloody engagements at the Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, at the North Anna River, and finally at Totopotomy Creek before settling in on the old Gaines Mill battlefield at a place called Cold Harbor. For most of the afternoon and into the evening, the Union attacked along a five-mile front on the Confederate right, with about 2,000 casualties on each side, and they very nearly broke the Confederate line that day before both sides settled in and began to entrench. After the failed Union assaults on June 1st, a decision was made to renew the attack as soon as possible, but it was delayed. And that delay gave the Confederate Army under Robert E. Lee ample time to reinforce their position. And by the time all was said and done, the Confederates had nearly seven miles of strong entrench uh, entrenchments. When Grant gave Meade the order for an attack, the order was given to three Union Corps totaling about 35,000 men to make the assault. When it was all said and done, only about 20,000 of them actually made the attack. Grant had told Meade to make sure that his corps commanders uh, reconnoitered the area, that they knew the ground they were attacking, that they had a good, strong battle plan. None of that happened. There was no real specific plan given. Grant just said, have these three corps make this assault on this place. It was left to the corps commanders to decide how many men they would use at what time, uh, and where exactly they would make that attack. In hindsight, a really bad decision because, uh, like I said, many of the Corps commanders didn't even use their whole force. Uh, the attack was poorly coordinated, it was poorly planned, and in hindsight, poorly executed.
I'm standing now near the center of what became the Union Assault on July 3rd, the morning of July 3rd. Horatio Wright was put in command of the Union 6th Corps after the death of the highest ranking Union officer to die during the American Civil War and probably one of the most popular. His name was Uncle John Sedgwick. And John Sedgwick had been killed at the Battle of Spotsylvania by a Confederate sharpshooter after remarking that the Confederate sharpshooters couldn't hit an elephant at that distance. Horatio Wright's new to command and uh, by all accounts was an adequate and certainly capable general. Didn't perform poorly, but didn't perform particularly outstanding either. But Wright had a problem. And the problem was that while he uh, commanded probably one-fifth of the entire Union Army, his front was only about one-fourteenth of the entire Union front. And so he had three divisions, but really only about enough room in his front to launch an attack by one division. And so that was Thomas Neal. And part of the disaster of the Union attack on the morning of June 3rd was how poorly it was coordinated. And so rather than attacking with all of his men, he only attacks with one of his three divisions. He was the center of the attack, and Thomas Neal's division attacked uh, without any support from the other divisions in the 6th Corps, and they really did not make that uh, attack particularly effectively either. In fact, one of the Confederate generals defending at this position would later say that he honestly had no idea that there had even been a major assault all along the Union line because the attack that they faced was so poor and was so weak. So let's talk about the aftermath of the assaults on June 3rd. June 3rd represented the last of the major fighting that took place here on the Cold Harbor battlefield. There were uh, smatterings of sharpshooters, artillery fire, uh, men continued to die for another eight or nine days. By mid-June, Grant had decided it was time to once again move south. And so he pulled his men out of this position, shifted to the south, and eventually they ended up in the siege lines at Petersburg. But that is a story for another battle, another day. The final casualty figures are often disputed, but we know that on the morning of June 3rd, the major assaults resulted in a very short time, maybe as short as an hour, in about 7,000 Union casualties, only about 1,500 on the Confederate side. All told for the Battle of Cold Harbor, the numbers looked very similar to Fredericksburg. Four or five thousand perhaps for the Confederates. The National Park Service actually estimates it as, uh, as few as 2,500. I think most historians agree on a number somewhere around 5,000. 
on the union side anywhere from 12 to 15,000 with most agreeing on around 13,000 as the total uh, figures for the day. Grant in his memoirs regretted two attacks that he made during the war. One was uh, the May, I think, 22nd assault that he made at Vicksburg before the siege began. And the other was the June 3rd assault at uh, Cold Harbor. He said, nothing came from it. We gained no strategic advantage. Uh, it was brutal, it was bloody, and it was basically worthless. He didn't use those words, but uh, that really sums up the Battle of Cold Harbor. Around 2,000 of the dead from Cold Harbor are buried here in the National Cemetery, which is really just perhaps less than a quarter mile to a half a mile from where most of the fighting took place here at Cold Harbor. The others are buried in numerous places. For the Confederate dead, most of the Confederate dead uh, from this and many other battlefields are now buried at Hollywood Cemetery in downtown Richmond, which I'm also going to be visiting this morning. When General Grant took command of all Union armies in 1864, one of the orders that he gave was for the heavies, as they were called, to be pulled from the fortifications around Washington. The heavy artillery regiments were these huge artillery regiments that numbered somewhere uh, upwards of 2,000 men uh, that were in these fortifications. Grant pulled them out of those fortifications and these regiments, these single regiments, sometimes numbered more than entire Union brigades. One such regiment is represented here by this monument in the National Cemetery. This is the monument to the 8th New York Heavy Artillery. And to give you a sense, not only of how large these regiments were, but also of how uh, horrifying the casualties were in the assault of June 3rd, Take a look at the names, all of the names on this monument in the National Cemetery from one regiment, from one day of fighting, one morning of fighting on June 3rd. 